A History of the Yoruba People. S. Adabanji Akindi. The Revolution in Ife, 10th to 11th century. In about the late 10th century, the storm that had slowly gathered over the political life of Ife burst. The result, according to all versions of the large wealth of Ife traditions, was a long period of conflict and turmoil, ending in a new political order. Of the human actors in this revolution, the greatest, according to all the traditions, was Odudua. So monumental was the role of this man that, probably even from as early as his own lifetime, popular traditions and legends elevated him to the awesome pedestal of father of the Yoruba race and founder of the monarchical system which thenceforth became their typical system of government. His successors deified him, and subsequent generations transposed him all the way back to the very beginning of creation and crowned him as the first human to walk the earth, the progenitor of the Yoruba race. In much of the effort made during the 20th century to study this revolutionary era in Yoruba history, the general direction was to look for Odujua's root in some distant foreign land outside of Africa, and to bring him as a conquering foreign prince to Ife. That direction was initiated by the Reverend Samuel Johnson in his famous The History of the Yorubas which was written in the final years of the 19th century and first published in 1921. According to Samuel Johnson, Odudua was leader of a group which left Arabia and the Middle East as a result of clashes between Islam and the traditional polytheistic religion of the place, and which finally found its way to Yoruba land and established itself over Ife. Until deep into the 20th century, some of the best minds available to us in historical scholarship took up Johnson's lead and followed it, and therefore it is important that we briefly examine the roots of Johnson's ideas concerning early Yoruba history. A son of Yoruba emigrants, liberated slaves returning home, from Sierra Leone in the 19th century, Samuel Johnson was educated for the service of the church. After elementary education in the Church Missionary Society, CMS, Mission School in Ibadan, he was sent, for secondary education, to the CMS Training Institution in Abeokuta, where he studied from the age of 16 until he graduated at 20, in 1866. He then returned to teach in Ibadan until 1882 after which he repeatedly featured in the peacemaking mission seeking to end the wars among various Yoruba states in the last two decades of the 19th century. The book The History of the Yorubas, which he started to write in these years, was completed in 1897. At the training institution in Abeokuta, he had schooled under a German teacher named G. F. Buller who, while training his students as church workers, gave them a very solid grounding in ancient history the history of Egypt, Babylon, Greece, and Rome. From such beginnings, Johnson developed a strong interest in the history and mythology of the Middle East. Moreover, Johnson's Yoruba land of the late 19th century was increasingly affected by the growth of Islam and Christianity, two world-shaping products of the Middle East. In particular, with Islam came the knowledge of Western Sudanese myths and legends through the writings of Muslims of the Western Sudan, including Hausaland, especially some of the writings of Sultan Bello of Sokoto which contain some Sudanese myths about Yoruba origins. Above all, the 19th century was, in Europe, the golden age of the study of the history and civilization of ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptian writings had just been deciphered, and the expanding knowledge of the wonders of ancient Egypt was creating great excitement in the world of scholarship. The writings of the emerging class of literate Yorubas were commonly laced with Egyptian and Middle Eastern references, analogies and mythology, a practice apparently regarded then as a mark of erudition, as a reading of the Lagos newspapers of the time will abundantly show. All these influences combined to shape much of Johnson's The History of the Yorubas, and to account for his linking of all important details of early beginnings of Yoruba history to the Middle East. Thus, Odudua became a personage from the Middle East, and Oranmian's migration northwards to the Niger country became a journey with the Middle East as its intended destination. Indeed, the influence of Middle Eastern mythology pervades most of Johnson's early history chapters, all the way from his preface. In contrast, his accounts of the history of the Oyo Empire were assembled from oral evidence he collected in places like Oyo and Ibadan where memories of the disintegration of that empire were still quite fresh, while his accounts of late 19th century Yoruba history were products of his own eyewitness observations of many of the events. Fortunately, while much effort was being expended in following Johnson's ideas about the beginnings of Yoruba history, there existed all around us, in Ife and other parts of Yoruba land an enormous wealth of traditions, as well as evidence in the Yoruba political system and surviving practices and rituals, about Odudua and his era. Ultimately, a different direction in the study of Yoruba history developed, as part of a more scientific study of African history in general, which focused on the indigenous evidence, as well as other source material, for the reconstruction of early Yoruba history. Consequent upon these efforts, we now stand able to lay aside, with respect, 
the Johnsonian hypothesis about the origins of Odudu and of the Yoruba. All who study the history of Ife and of the Yoruba people are now generally agreed that the great political changes which began in Ife in about the 10th century were indigenous in their origin, in their unfolding and in their dramatis personae. It is on the soil of Yoruba land that Oduduwa was born and raised, it is only in that soil that his roots can be found. The traditional accounts of the development and growth of the political troubles in Ife and Oduduwa's time are many and complicated. Countless versions exist, each with its own twist, orientation and emphasis. Even in spite of an intervening period of about 1,000 years, partisan differences and passions about these events are still quite real in Ife. Nevertheless, by carefully sifting through the infinite variety of traditions and versions, we can put together the basic traditional narrative that follows. Some small settlements had, for a long time, existed on hills beyond the immediate environs of the settlements in the Ife Bowl. At some point in time, one of them moved down staked claims to some land within the area and started to build a new settlement. Its leader was a man named Odudua. Before this group came, there was already an area that the old settlements generally regarded as land for strangers. It was into this area that the group now commonly represented in the traditions as the Odudua group moved. From the moment that this group arrived, it was unprepared to accept the claims of precedence by the older settlements, it was also not willing to have any dealings with the existing alliance of kings. All this led to the beginning of conflicts between the Odudua group and some of the older settlements, and these conflicts got worse over a long time. At some point in the conflicts, an influential citizen of one of the old settlements, a man named Oreluir, or Or, thought of a way to subdue Odudu and restore peace. He poisoned one of Odudua's daughters, another version says that he wounded one of Odudua's sons, confident that Odudua would come to him for herbal treatment for his sick daughter, or son. Odudua proudly refused to seek help and went about treating the sick by himself, but he did not have the necessary herbal knowledge and skill, and he did not make much progress. At last, he went to Oreluir for help. As Oreluir had hoped, this led to communication and then peace. But it turned out to be a short truce. Conflicts were resumed, and Oreluir became one of Odudua's leading adversaries. The confrontation was fierce. Oreluir and many of his men received terrible wounds in the fighting. But Odudua and his group were overpowered and forced to agree to pay tribute of sheep and fowls. Yet, the Odudua group was not dislodged, it rebuilt its strength and was ready to fight again. As these new conflicts dragged on, some of the old settlements threw their weight in with Odudua. Some settlements were destroyed and scattered, new settlements sprang up here and there. The confusion, loss of lives, and destruction of property were beyond description. At last, all parties agreed to attempt to make peace, and Obatala, King of Idida and chairman of the Alliance of Kings, was put in charge of the arrangements for general negotiations towards permanent peace, permanent existence, according to the traditions. But Obatala was incompetent and unstable, often getting drunk, and his excessive claims to authority alienated many. By contrast, Odujawa's excellent qualities of leadership won the admiration of even his most tenacious enemies. Many of these enemies chose to continue to fight Odudua, but more and more of them gave up the fight or decamped to the Odudua side. In fact, one of the decamping leaders, Obamarai, became Odudua's general. Obatala became the leader of those still fighting Odudua, and his formidable home settlement of Idida, of which he was king, became the backbone of the anti-Odudua war. However, he and his followers steadily declined in strength. A major attack led by Obamarai dislodged Obatala from Idida and forced him and his followers to withdraw to an area beyond the Ezen Manrin stream where they established their camp and named it Idida Oko, Idida in the Woods. At Idida Oko they increased their strength considerably and then embarked upon a series of determined campaigns to retake Ife, but a strong Odudua force under Obamarai encamped at Odin to fight them off again and again. In the end, all the parties, battered and decimated, desired peace. The toll in human suffering was heavy. Small groups of dislodged persons, hoping to find peace, established fragile little settlements on the farmlands. At Idita Oko, a smallpox epidemic broke out and caused terrible loss of lives seriously weakening the Obatala forces. At last, a group led by a prince named Ojum who urged all for peace. The resulting peace agreement provided that Obatala and his followers be readmitted into Ife. Idita Oko was therefore broken up as its inhabitants returned to the ruins of Idita. The peace agreement also provided for a new permanent existence, or constitution, under which the new people, the followers of Odudua, and elements of the old settlements would be fused together as the new government for Ife. By then, Odudua had become, far and away, the most dominant leader in Ife. Practically all were prepared to accept him as their ruler, 
and all looked up to him to lead Ife back to order and peace. Obatala had no choice other than to concede authority to him. For the most part, then, peace returned. Only some of the most irreconcilable of Obatala's followers continued to hold out against peace. This faction, led by Oba Inrin, king of the old settlement of the Winrin, refused to return to Ife from Ididoko, but rather moved further away from Ife to a place which became known as Igbo Igbo, Forest of the Igbo, from where they continued for a long time to harass the outskirts of the new Ife with lightning raids that usually left people dead and houses burning. Rather, however, than stultify the consolidation of the new Ife, as they were meant to do, these raids actually helped its growth as will be seen below. Thus, the basic narrative of the events of the political turmoil as it has come down to us in the traditions. The first comment concerning this narrative is that the events described in it are preserved by the many traditional agencies concerned with the preservation of Ife's history in the palace of the Uni of Ife, in the compounds of the chiefs, in the many shrines at which Ife people traditionally worshipped, and in the Ajui Fa. Perhaps more significantly, many of the details of these events are preserved in some forms of Ife's art as well as in rituals of great importance in the life of the Ife kingdom. For instance, artists believed to be contemporary with the events left sculptures in stone representing Aureliuir and showing the wounds that he and his followers suffered in the battles. Then there is a very important festival that the Uni and the people of Ife celebrate annually to commemorate these events in Ife's history. Called Itepa, meaning, roughly, the Great Conflict, this festival does not merely reenact some of the events of those times, it also stands for an annual reaffirmation of the legitimacy of the Unis kingship. During this festival, the priests of Obatala marked their bodies with white dots in remembrance of the smallpox epidemic which had put deadly pustules on many people in Obatala's camp at Ididoko. On the seventh day of Atapa, rituals are carried out to ward off smallpox from Ife. On the eve of the eleventh day, the whole populace of Ife is supposed to weep and wail in remembrance of the day on which Obatala and his followers were expelled from Ife in a terrible battle, and on the eleventh day, there is joyful celebration of two events first the peace agreement which ended the wars, and second, the readmission of Obatala and his followers into Ife. The Atapa festival is believed to have been instituted soon after the events it commemorates. Not only were the events carved in stone, as it were, some of the leading actors in them were too. Every culture has its own way of preserving the memory of its most important people. The Yoruba culture does so by deifying them and establishing shrines at which they can be periodically commemorated through rituals. Oduduwa was deified after his death and an Oduduwa shrine exists in Ila Ife, with its own priests and regular rituals a very important institution in the life of the Ife kingdom. Obatala too was later deified. In fact Obatala became identified with Orizinla, the most senior of the Yoruba gods. This strange elevation of Obatala to Orizinla seems like an attempt by his followers to make the statement that though Obatala had been defeated and relegated to insignificance by Oduduwa, he remained a most important personage in Ife's history. Even some of the lesser persons in this era of Ife history were later deified, such as Obamari and Aureliuir. What then were the causes of the collapse of order in the Ife bowl? Once the conflict started, why did they become so vicious, and why was it impossible to make peace until all parties became virtually exhausted? Most of the popular traditional accounts in Ife trace the beginning of the troubles to the arrival of the Otodua group and its unwillingness to recognize any rights of precedence or accept the order that had long existed. Obviously, this is no more than the orthodox version preserved by the people of the pre Oduduwa settlements who have always been the majority of the population of the new city of Ila Ife, created in Oduduwa's time. Even these same versions contain fairly detailed information pointing to the fact that the causes of the conflicts were deeper and wider. According to such details, settler groups had been finding their way into the Ife Bowl since a very distant past. The rate of their coming had been generally slow no more than a few groups in centuries. But the very considerable prosperity in the Ife area by the 9th century, in agriculture, trade, manufacturing, improvements in the quality of life, etc., turned Ife into a very desirable place to go and settle. Consequently, a growing stream of immigrants arrived over a relatively short time. Those who came as individuals or families seeking inclusion in the old compounds and lineages were, by and large, so included and absorbed. But things were different for those that came as coherent groups seeking space to settle fragments that had hived off from other settlements, or whole settlements that wanted to relocate. Claims of the older settlements, and rigid boundaries to the farmlands, created a situation in which such newly arriving groups could not easily settle in places immediately desirable to them. Even though virgin forests lay in all directions beyond the immediate area of the Ilu, the jostling and resentment of the newly arriving groups in the immediate Ilu area created a sort of artificial land hunger there. 
At first, under this pressure, the old settlements, according to the traditions, designated an area as stranger's area. And in that stranger's area small settler dwellings mushroomed. The group that was later to achieve prominence as the Oduduwa group was one of the larger groups in this medley. Ultimately, sporadic conflicts developed between the new arrivals and the older settlements, and then on a jaggedly widening front each old settlement keeping aloof until the conflicts rolled to its door. As the resentment and hostilities grew, the political arrangement existing in Ife was incapable of dealing with them. A common authority did not exist. There was an alliance, for sure, but, as earlier pointed out, it was a very loose one as each of the old settlements jealously guarded its autonomy. More often than not, the chairman of the alliance was in some trouble with some rulers and settlements and could not get much accomplished at the collective level. In fact, the rulers in the alliance most often preferred to behave as if there was no alliance at all. In these circumstances, every chairman of the alliance seemed incompetent. As is clear from the traditions, sporadic acts of violence erupted between the so-called strangers and some of the older settlements in an irregularly widening front. Each old settlement kept aloof until the troubles rolled to its door. At some point in this growing turmoil, Oduduwa became ruler of his little group and then leader of all the stranger elements. When that happened, the collective group of stranger elements acquired a leadership with unusual courage, vision and elan, and its strength and confidence exploded. With some of the old settlements already in ruins, the remaining old settlements at last acted together and appointed Obatala, until then an ineffectual chairman of the old alliance, as their leader. This pitched the two leading men in Ife Oduduwa and Obatala against each other, and the fighting entered its most terrible, most bloody, phase. As it happened, Oduduwa was a much better leader and statesman than Obatala, whose unstable behavior lost him the loyalty of some of his most capable followers who then went over and offered their services to Oduduwa. The balance of strength shifted slowly in favor of the Oduduwa forces. By the time Obatala and his followers were expelled from Ife and pushed beyond the Azanmin Rin stream, most of the old settlements were in ruins. The pitched battles that followed after that only added to the destruction. How long, then, did these conflicts and wars last? The traditional accounts all insist that the troubles in Ife, from the beginning to the end, went on for a very long time. Some versions even have it that the troubles went on for 201 years. There is a strong probability that 201 is no more than typical Yoruba hyperbole, still, there seems to be no doubt that the era of troubles, starting with the early resentments and minor acts of hostility and ending with the Ojamu peace, went on for very many decades. Akinogandiran, after carefully researching the Ife traditions, has suggested that the conflict started in the late 9th century and went on until the early 11th century and that would seem to be borne out by the generality of the traditions. That raises the important question about the time span of Oduduwa's participation in the conflicts. The traditional accounts put Odudu and Obatala at the very beginnings of the conflicts to their very end, and then, after that, present us with very detailed information about Odudu as king ruling over the new unified city of Ife for many decades altogether a very improbable construct. There is no doubt that Odudu and Obatala were the most prominent persons in the last stages of the wars. Neither, therefore, could have been actors, or even could have been born, at the beginning of the conflicts. An examination of most of the traditions fairly definitively established that Oduduwa was born in the strangers' area of Ife to leaders of a small group that had relocated from one of the hills beyond the Ilua Ife, that he grew up in the tradition of resentment in the strangers' area, and that his youth and Obatala's youth, both of them sons of the soil, were spent in the tradition of growing conflicts in Ife. The traditional accounts put both men in the era of conflicts from its beginning to its end, obviously, because of their extremely dominant roles in its latter stages. In the light of this, it is reasonably certain that the group which became popularly known as the Oduduwa group in the traditions was led to the Ife area not by Oduduwa but by his parents or grandparents. Not until practically everything lay in ruins and all parties were exhausted was meaningful compromise and peace possible. Obatala returned to the ruins of Idita, and other surviving kings must also have returned to the ruins of their various settlements, determined, most certainly, to start to rebuild. But the world they had always known had vanished. In all directions, indefinable groups of displaced persons lay jumbled together, feebly casting around to start life anew. Very clearly, a new order was needed, but such a concept was far too strange and too high for most to grasp. Fortunately, in the midst of all the rubble, there was one man who understood the great need of the moment and, by understanding the need, came to an understanding too of the concept even though, as far as we know, he does not seem to have had any precedent to go by. His name was Oduduwa probably because he was not a product of an old Ife settlement with some grand name or history, 
he was freed to see the realities and the need of the moment clearly. While the kings of the old settlements must have agonized about rebuilding them, Odudua dreamed of new possibilities and prospects. A completely new pattern of settlement was needed, a new settlement comprising all, under one leader who was king of all? Odudua began to gather together the pieces of that new settlement Ila Ife, the first city in the Yoruba forests, the first city of the Yoruba people. To summarize then, by the 9th century, Ife had grown to a point where its old political system of many autonomous, small kingdoms could no longer hold it together. A large array of economic and social forces had created, more or less, a single Ife society. Trade was stretching the reach of that society to distant parts of the world. The growth of art in various forms and media shows that the human mind in this Ife society was expanding, exploring, and reaching out beyond itself. Even in religion. Many of the gods worshipped in Ife were no longer merely gods of the small settlements, but gods of all the settlements and of a whole people, known and worshipped in distant parts of the Yoruba forests some of them originating outside Ife. Powerful new professions and cults simply rejected the boundaries represented by the autonomous little settlements. Only the political arrangement, of many small, separate, autonomous, settlements, reinforced by powerful religious beliefs was not changing at a rate commensurate with the multiple changes in other aspects of the life of the area. In the end, the irresistible forces of change simply ripped this political straitjacket to shreds, in the process creating a horrendous explosion that shattered lives and a lot of treasured possessions. From the smoldering ruins, the new pattern of life that had been straining to come into existence was about to be born. Odudua was camped in the partly ruined compounds of Amalaga and when the fighting ended. Within days, he moved his base to Idio a low hill gently sloping in all directions. From Idio, he embarked upon the huge task of allocating sites for all identifiable groups. When that was completed, he invited the kings of the old settlements to move with their people to the new locations that he had chosen for them. The massive movements of people began, each group to its predetermined location around the center of the new city. The old settlements, as well as the new ones that had sprung up during the wars, were abandoned. In all directions around Odujua's location, the new city of Ila Ife slowly emerged. As this proceeded, Odudua embarked on two important tasks provision of security for the new city, and elaboration of the city's new system of government. Just as the city was forming, attacks on it began from Igbo Igbo. Odudua therefore mobilized the citizens of the new city for the building of a protective wall round their city. And, as he and his people worked on building Ila Ife's first city wall, he established the details of the new city government. The Odudua constitution as it emerged, took the following form. Ila Ife had only one king and that was Odudua himself, whose family became the royal family and, in the well-known tradition of kingship in the Ife bowl, would provide the kings in succession forever. The city thus became one single kingdom under one king, and not an alliance, confederation, or federation of kingdoms. Each of the kings of the pre-Odudua settlements had used to hold the R, the sacred symbol of royalty. These were now surrendered to Odudua so that only Odudua as king of Ila Ife could hold the R. With the R in his possession, the king of Ila Ife became the legitimate leader of every single one of the old settlements and their lineages, and any claims to ultimate leadership by their former kings were thus terminated. Everybody thenceforth looked up to the king alone as their ruler, chosen and upheld by the gods, and it became the prerogative of the king to appoint any citizen to governmental roles and duties in the new society. The city was then delineated into quarters, each quarter under a quarter chief. The former kings, as found appropriate, were appointed quarter chiefs in their quarters, and other significant citizens were appointed quarter chiefs in other sections of the city. Below the level of the quarter chiefs, other chieftaincies were instituted in every quarter. Such chiefs, installed by the king and subject to his government, assisted in their neighborhoods the quarter chiefs. Like the kingship, every chieftaincy title, quarter chief or neighborhood chief, was hereditary in one lineage, when a chief died, members of his lineage nominated from among themselves a candidate acceptable to the king for him to appoint and install. The king also had the prerogative to establish chieftaincies for special duties war chiefs, palace officials, etc. Some of such special function chieftaincies were not hereditary, meaning that the king could select any notable citizens to them. In the palace, the king was served by officials known as Omodeoa, employed mostly as royal messengers. In the early years of the Ife Kingdom, as its form of government gradually crystallized, there emerged a special extra-governmental body known as the Ogbonia body comprising the highest political and religious leaders and other eminent citizens notable for their experience in public affairs and their supreme knowledge of the traditions. In its council, the Ogboni worshipped the primordial spirits of the earth rather than the latter-day Yoruba gods. 
they held that the earth was older than the gods, and that the Ogbone was older than the kingship. The membership of the Ogbone was bound together by extremely powerful oaths, and its meetings and other activities were conducted in uttermost secrecy. All this, and its uniquely prestigious membership, gave the Ogboni enormous respect and influence, and it used that influence to watch over the affairs of the kingdom especially over the integrity of political institutions and of the performance of public officials, including even the king. In this watchdog role, it could, always in its secret councils, call to question, and penalize, any public officials, and employ powerful cultic sanctions against errant conduct that threaten the quality of public stewardship, the image of the government, or the welfare of society. By the mass of ordinary citizens, the Ogboni was viewed as a cult of powerful people, shrouded in secrecy, possessed of limitless spiritual capabilities, guarded by secret oaths, an institution about which even the highest chiefs spoke in muffled tones to even the members of their own families, if they spoke of it at all. Its council chamber called Aliti, the House of Secret Bonds, was feared and avoided by members of the public. Its symbols, the brass staffs called Edun, usually in pairs, male and female, had supernatural powers ascribed to them. As objects of protection, they were supposed to be able to foretell if danger or serious sickness was about to come to a member, to be able to ward off such sickness or danger, and to heal a sick member. As symbols of the judicial and penal authority of the group, and as objects of spiritual communication, they were believed to be able to travel long distances on their own, flying like birds, and to go through obstacles on their way. Therefore, any person declared guilty and targeted for punishment by Ogboni was believed to have no means of evading the punishment. As watchers over the realm, Ogboni held its members to the very highest standards of honesty and probity, and inflicted, through occult and ritual sanctions, terminal penalties on any member who infringed such standards. Their tenet of faith was that the earth and the ancestors were the givers of the moral laws for the conduct of leaders of society and that the earth and the ancestors had charged the Ogboni and its council with vigilance over the moral laws, and had vested the Ogboni with limitlessly efficacious sanctions for their enforcement. Everything about the Ogboni points to the fact that it was modeled on some rudiment found in the culture of the small settlements of pre oduduwa times. What seems to have happened is that the leaders of the new kingdom under Oduduwa came to the determination that, in order to protect the offices and functions of their new kingdom from the corruption that could result from the frailties and wickednesses of humans, some type of higher institution was needed to watch over the institutions of state and to moderate the behavior of the state's officials and leading citizens. They then brought the Ogboni into being and upheld its influence and power. The Ogboni was to become a significant gift of Odujua Zife kingdom to the political culture of the future kingdoms of the Yoruba people. Odujua did not establish a new system of government. What he did was to take the old system of monarchy, which had developed and matured in Ife and other parts of Yoruba land before his time, and employ it in the service of a larger agglomeration of people, a wider polity. His greatness consists in his ability to conceive and create a more inclusive society with wider loyalties far above the small, encrusted, ancient kingdoms that he had known in his youth. Unknown to him, we must assume, he was showing to the Yoruba people in general a new line of development. The city of Ila Ife and its type became the pattern of existence for most of Yoruba land, making the Yoruba the most urbanized people in the tropical African forests, an urbanism which impacted their cultural growth in countless ways and made them the proud possessors of what many regard as Africa's highest indigenous civilization. They are therefore right in their designation of Oduduwa as father of the Yoruba nation. Soon, the first Ila Ife wall was completed. It was about 7 kilometers in circumference, with a maximum diameter of about 2.3 kilometers. A second wall was embarked upon not long after that. Most probably, more people were coming to settle in the new city than first expected, and houses were springing up beyond the first wall, vulnerable to the attacks from Igbo Igbo. This second wall had a circumference of about 15 kilometers, with a maximum diameter of about 5.2 kilometers. Concerning the attacks from Igbo Igbo, a tale exists in Yoruba folklore about one of the later king's wives named Marimi. According to this tale, which various generations of Yoruba people have amplified and even set to song, this beautiful woman, determined that the Igbo Igbo raids had to stop, deliberately let herself be captured and taken to Igbo Igbo. While there, she became a wife to their ruler and was therefore able to learn all the secrets of the planning and execution of their raids on Ila Ife. She then escaped and returned home, and the information that she brought enabled the government of her husband said to be the Uniabalu phone, probably Odujua's immediate successor, to defeat the Igbo and end their raids. Most of the people at Igbo Igbo ultimately returned to live in Ila Ife. The most touching part of this tale is that this woman, in preparation for her adventure, 
had asked protection from the spirit of a local stream, and pledged that, if she succeeded in her adventure, she would sacrifice her only son to that spirit. And when she returned alive and the Igbo raids were decisively brought to an end, she did take the painful step of sacrificing her only son. We do not know how much of all this is history and how much is fiction. However, there is no doubt that the story was meant to illustrate the fact that people were so much in love with their new city that they would make even the most painful personal sacrifices for its welfare. Evidence is slim about the impact of Odujua's kingship on religion and rituals in his new kingdom. It would seem that the popularity of particular gods of the pre odujua settlements gradually waned, whereas the gods with the wider perspectives received increased emphasis. The cult of Ogun, in particular, became a special royal cult, and Ogun became, in addition to being the god of iron, also the god of war the giver of victory in war. Odudua devoted very special attention to the economy first, the economy in general, and second, the establishment of economic support systems for the monarchy. There is unambiguous evidence that agriculture took some time to revive from the ravages of the recent wars. Odudua seems to have started the royal tradition of personal patronage of farming by the king, and to have raised some crops himself. The return of peace liberated the energies of the people, and according to the traditions, food slowly became plentiful in Ife again. The same happened in the production of cash crops, especially the major long-distance export, kalanuts. Though the Ife area was already a substantial center of trade before Odudua, most of the evidence in oral traditions indicates that the time of Odudua marked the beginning of a steep rise in trade. Odudua himself appears to have made much personal contribution to this boosting of trade. He established a central market for the new city, providing for royal messengers to keep peace in it. By doing this, in fact, he established the tradition whereby every Yoruba king was supposed to establish a central marketplace, the king's market, in the vicinity of the palace, and serve as patron of the trading going on there. From Odudua, Oba, king, and Olaja, owner or father of the market, became synonymous in Yoruba political tradition, the palace and the central plaza of the market became inseparable. About the great importance of long-distance trade under Odudua, a special note is called for. Some verses in Ajuifa describe Odudua himself as having gained enormous wealth from exporting large quantities of kalanats to the north and bringing many horses from there to Ife. The impression that one gets from other sources, however, is that it is doubtful that Odudua personally took that much part in trade. What the Ifa verses most probably mean is that, in Odudua's time, Ife traders made a lot of money from the kalanat and horse trades. The palace may have bought many horses, mostly for prestige, and horses seem to have been in common use among royal messengers and leading chiefs. The king's special attention to long-distance trade as a source of wealth is indicated in the provisions he made for orderly, peaceful traffic on the roads leading to and from Ife. Some traditions have it that Ipatumaju in the northern outskirts of Vila Ife started as a customs post established by Odudua to guard Igbodola, the Greater Gate, on the northern route, and to collect tolls there. A calico. The first gatekeeper at this place, is said to have been one of Odujua's most trusted followers, in fact, before or during his tenure as gatekeeper there, he was given one of Odujua's daughters in marriage. So great importance did the king attach to the northern route. We do not have similarly precise information in the traditions about other routes leading into and out of Ila Ife southwest to the Ijebu country, and east to the Ijesa and Ekiti countries. It seems probable, however, that the town of Apamu which later became a major trading center for the Ife kingdom, started its history under Odudua as a tall gate and market center on the Ijebu route. Somewhere also on the outskirts of Ila Ife, a toll gate or guard post developed in Odudua's time that was later to acquire fame in Yoruba traditions. Known as Ida Ijero, this place developed into a sort of rendezvous where groups from Ila Ife usually gathered to start journeys to parts of Yoruba land. The overall impression from the traditions is that this famous spot was located on the eastern route. In the report of his archaeological survey already referred to, Paulozan points out that on Ilife's first city wall the entrance which pointed eastwards towards Ilase and Benin had a massive entrance enclosure. This was almost certainly a tall gate and guard post, and probably the spot known to the traditions as Ida Ijero. Odurjua's time also marked a major upsurge in manufacturing, a development that was likewise directly stimulated by the king himself. His victories in the wars against the old pre Ila Ife settlements had owed much to his efficient attention to the production of weapons for his men. From the moment he became king in Ila Ife, he attached very high priority to manufacturing. He even appointed a royal blacksmith named Ogunladin to head a large royal smithy close to the palace. Although the traditions are not explicit on this point, Ogunladin's smithy seems to have been a place for the manufacture of stockpiles of weapons, machetes, spear blades, 
arrow blades, swords, etc., for Odujua's palace as well as other iron goods for the market. In general, the old iron industry, both smelting and fabrication, expanded rapidly under Odujua. It was probably in his time that the Ife area became decisively the central supplier of iron goods to different parts of the Yoruba forests. Another industry whose expansion was closely related to Odujua's reign was the bead industry. To elevate the glory of the monarchy before the people of the new city, Odudua is said to have turned to lavish use of beads in the royal regalia in his crowns and clothes, as bracelets, wristlets, anklets, etc. In early Yoruba society, beads, rather than gold, were the great treasure of personal adornment. By and large, the chiefs, high and low, followed Odujua's example, though at comparatively more modest scales. As a modest imitation of the king's crown, the oro came into being, a chiefly cap adorned with beads. Some traditions even seem to suggest that some wall surfaces in Odujua's residence were studded with decorative beads. Beads became the favored package of gifts to the king and his chiefs on festivals and other special occasions. Such heavy demands for beads pushed the bead industry higher and higher, both in volume and quality. Increasing volumes of beads and head loads left Ife along the trade routes. The king himself became the patron of all bead makers, and the traditions indicate that some sort of royal regulation of the industry was instituted. As bead production kept increasing, the traditional local smelting of raw bead glass failed to keep up with bead production, and bead manufacturers melted down other types of glass, glass products imported from Europe through the Sahara trade routes, to produce beads. All told, bead production and the bead trade became a very significant item in the economy of Vila Ife, a source from which some citizens built substantial wealth. The richest of these was a woman trader named Olokun whom tradition has identified as one of Odujua's wives but who, more probably, was not related to Odudua at all. After her death, she was deified as goddess of the sea the sea being regarded as the largest and richest body of water on the earth. Olokun also became the patron goddess of bead manufacturers and traders. In later times, the goddess Olokun became, fittingly, wife of the god Odudua. We will end this list of the high points of the Ila Ife economy under Odudua by touching on the sculptural arts that is art in wood, clay, stone and metals. As pointed out in an earlier chapter, most of Ife's sculptures before Odudua were in wood, clay and stone and, according to the traditions, a beginning in brass-slash-bronze casting. Wood sculptures mostly serve the decorative demands of home, ag boil, shrine and palace buildings. In Ila Ife, the building of the Agbo Ila rose to higher and higher levels of structural soundness and decorative beauty. The generally growing economic prosperity showed itself in the growing quality of compounds. A large class of wood sculptors arose, hired to work in new constructions throughout the city. The wooden carvings became generally more sophisticated. Wooden posts supporting eaves and decorating verandas became more and more detailed images of men and women standing or kneeling to the task, the women with braided hair. Main doors to many Agbo Ila became masterpieces of carvings in bar relief. Similar sophistication, it might be added here, was true of the old arts of wall murals and engravings, known as Ewope, and potsherd paving of courtyards and hallways. Sculptures in stone and molded clay improved greatly in the urban culture of the new city, but very clearly, the medium specially preferred by the new monarchy was brass or bronze. The growing volume of trade from across the Sahara increasingly supplied the copper for this art. During the 400 years following Odujua's reign, it grew into a special symbol of Ife royalty. As a final note to this chapter, it must not be imagined that the new monarchy under Odudua did not encounter any political difficulty. It did. Some members of the pre odudua ruling families continued to fret for some time about their loss of power. In fact, a few of them formed themselves into a secret cult with the name Imol, determined to resist, in particular, the loss of their traditional land. Some traditions even indicate that Odudua intended to build a grand palace but that distractions caused by political difficulties prevented him. On the whole, however, Odudua's reign was a long and peaceful one, and his methods and style of leadership were major contributors to that. In accordance with the agreement reached to end hostilities, Odudua made sincere efforts to create a leadership that welded all segments of the new society together. Besides appointing the former kings as quarter chiefs, he also included many members of their lineages in appointments to significant positions and generally made them feel accepted and honored in the new order of things. This policy of dignified inclusiveness weakened dissent and robbed it of support, it also tended to make persons in leadership positions proud to belong to the Odudua state system. After Odudua, such a policy became the proof of wisdom in an Ife king, and any king who was careless or negligent about it tended to invite trouble for himself and for his kingdom. Moreover, Life in the growing city was changing in many ways. 
the Ebi, lineage, and its Agboila, lineage compound, remain the basic building block of society in the new urban setting, and would so remain till the 20th century, but urban life rubbed off much of the pre adudua rigidities and exclusiveness of that structure. Tradesmen, artisans, artists, traders had a larger customer base to serve in one single community an unprecedented opportunity to prosper, and urban competition stimulated professionalism and excellence. Every male was still, by general perception, a farmer, but city-based professionals of all types emerged. According to innumerable hints in the traditions, the city environment also bred entertainers, bands, bards, singers, storytellers, musical groups, as well as new instruments and styles of popular music. In various professions and pursuits, some men and women acquired city-wide prominence for instance Ogunlet and the master blacksmith, Ellis Ia the great physician, or Unmala the master diviner, Olokun the richest woman trader, Abaji the large-scale plantain farmer, etc. The king's palace became the center of society, and its festivals became the magnet that pulled large cheering crowds of people together from time to time. To meet the people's expectations, the king in the palace tried harder and harder to glow and dazzle for society to gaze at and worship. There were people, and they were many, who could never forgive Odudua, but they would never even think of throwing out what he had given to all. After he had passed away, the leaders deified him and set up a shrine to his worship. Then, after some squabbling among them, they crowned their next king. The royal city of Ila Ife, the heart of the kingdom of Ife and source of light to the Yoruba people had come to stay.